Today, we're gonna dive deep into HTTP status codes. This one's gonna be a real thriller, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you that much. We're gonna go deep into the nerd stuff, right? What are HTTP status codes, why they're important, how they affect your website, and how they affect your digital marketing strategy. We're gonna blow your hair back on this one, I'll tell you that much. Stay for the whole video, we're gonna do a comprehensive overview of all of the most important HTTP status codes. My name's Tommy Griffith with clickminded.com, let's get going. All right, folks, buckle in, because we're about to blast off on this one. So let's dive into HTTP status codes a little bit. Before we go really heavy into that, I just want to talk about some really high-level kind of internet basics and basics around web protocols. We'll just take 30 seconds and do a quick refresher to, so that everyone's on the same page, right? So some of the web protocol basics that affect HTTP status codes. Keep in mind, remember, the internet is really made up of two different core things, and that's clients and servers, right? And so anytime you open up your laptop and you click on your browser, you're accessing the internet through a web client, right? Maybe it's Chrome, maybe it's Firefox, maybe it's Safari, or if you're a godforsaken human being, maybe it's Internet Explorer, right? But that's a web client. Whenever you go to a website, you're making a request to a web server, right? 216.58.214.78, as sexy as that sounds, Google.com is actually much easier to remember. So every time you're going to Google.com, you're actually making a request from the IP address 216.58.214.78. Facebook, clickminer.com, a specific recipe website, right? All of these have their own IP address, right? So whenever I access one of these sites, I'm accessing it via my client, Google Chrome, and I'm accessing that web server, right? So every time you type facebook.com into your browser and hit enter, right? You, the client, are making a request to Facebook, the server, right? So that's the basic relationship. And you're often requesting a whole bunch of documents from that server, right? So maybe it's HTML, maybe it's CSS, maybe it's an image, a PDF file, whatever it is. You're requesting a bunch of files on that server, right? You make the request and the server responds to you. That's the basic relationship, right? You make this request using what we call the HTTP protocol, okay? So protocols are really just standards that everyone on the internet has agreed to. It's no different than English or Spanish or Chinese. It's a language that we've all agreed to, right? And so that's the basic idea with this client-server relationship. You enter a website, you hit enter, you're making a request for files on a server. You make that request with the HTTP protocol, that server responds to you, right, with whatever you're asking for. That's the basics of kind of what we're talking about today when we're talking about HTTP status codes, right? You click another link on a website, what happens? The same thing. You make a request and the server responds. So every time you're interacting on a website, this relationship kind of continues in perpetuity, right? You make a request and the server responds. That's happening every single time you're clicking a link. So there's a ton of different protocols out there. You know a lot of them. DNS is the domain name service protocol. FTP is the file transfer protocol, right? HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. That's gonna be the one we're, we're talking about today. People are really excited about cryptocurrency right now because it's potentially a new protocol for money, right? And so there's a lot of different protocols out there. Protocols are important. Uh, HTTP is the most popular, most used one. So we're gonna be talking about more HTTP status codes today and how they affect you and your website, right? So we're talking now about HTTT, HTTP protocol status codes. So a client makes a request to the server, what happens next? Status codes let us know whether the request was a success, a failure, or something in between, right? That's what an HTTP status code is. Let's take a look at the five core status codes next. Okay, so let's jump into each one of these next. So the 100 block, these are informational requests. Uh, the 200 block, those are successful requests. The 300 block are gonna be for redirects, redirection. 400 block will be for client errors, and 500 block will be for server errors. So we'll dive into each one of these next. So the 100 block, these are informational requests. Basically, the server hasn't fully completed the request yet, and it's still thinking. It's kind of a transitional sort of phase. You're not gonna see this this much, but I just wanted to briefly go over it if you do see it, right? So uh, status code 100, that'd be to continue. A 101's for switching protocol, and a 103 is for checkpoints. Again, you're not gonna see this this much, but if you do, that's what it is. The server has not yet completed the request. 200 block requests, these are successful requests. Usually you're gonna see your 200 
status code 200 the most. There's a couple of other ones, created, accepted, reset, or partial, but in general, a 200 request is great. That means everything happened like planned, and that's usually what you're going for. The 300 block R4 redirects, right? So you requested an address, but you were sent somewhere else. And there's a bunch of different types of redirects, right? A 301 redirect, a 302, a 304, 305, and 307. We're gonna talk about all these a little bit more, but any status code on the 300 block will be a redirection uh, request. 400 block are for client errors, right? That means the page wasn't found, something is wrong with the request, right? So whatever is happening on the client side is the issue, right? A 400 might be a bad request, a 401 unauthorized, a 403 forbidden. We're gonna talk about the most important ones a little bit later, but the basic idea here is that any, any status code that comes in as a 400 is a client error. And finally, the server errors on the 500 block, right? So that means the client made a good request, but the server didn't complete it. So something is wrong on the server side, right? I'm in Chrome, I request the website. I did everything right on my end, but something's wrong with the server, right? So like a 500, an internal server error, maybe a 502, bad gateway. 503, service unavailable, 504, gateway timeout. Again, we're gonna dive into the most important ones in a little bit, but the broad idea here is that 500 errors are server problems, not client problems. Okay, so now I wanna talk about some of the most important status codes for digital marketing. The good ones, the bad ones, and the ones you need to solve right away. Getting the technical stuff right is super important. It's absolutely devastating to put all this work into your site or into your digital marketing strategy only to have it all messed up by technical status code issues. So getting these right is absolutely critical to succeeding. So let's talk about the good stuff first. 200s, the HTTP status code 200, this means a success, right? So this is what you want. A well-functioning URL will respond with a 200 status code. Users, bots, everything else went perfect. Everything's being requested, everything's being returned, no problems at all. You want 200 requests, this is good news. Next up is a 301. This is a moved permanently request, right? So a 301, it's also colloquially known as a 301 redirect, right? Should be used anytime you're permanently replacing a URL for another URL, right? Users and bots are permanently moved to the new URL. This new URL will usually replace the old URL in search results and the old URL will eventually disappear. Also, critically and almost most importantly, link equity is passed from the old URL to the new URL. That means that if you've acquired a bunch of links on an old URL and you 301 redirect that old URL to that new URL, you're gonna get all that link equity and that URL has the potential to replace the old URL in search results. 301 redirects are usually the redirect of choice anytime you're changing URLs, right? This is a usually a great redirect to have. Now let's talk about the 302 redirect, the response found. 302 redirects in general are bad. You usually don't wanna be implementing them. They're similar to 301s in behavior, however, link equity is not passed. These are usually used for temporary situations, right? URLs are also not replaced in search results. There's just very few situations where you would use this. Um, most of the time, 301 redirects are a bad idea. You almost always wanna be using 301 redirects instead. 302 redirects are used for very temporary situations where you're kind of maybe collecting data. Uh, A-B tests, if you were manually doing an A-B test, you might be, um, and you were bucketing users on your own, you might be implementing a 302 redirect. It's very rare that you use them out in the wild. You usually wanna stick with 301 redirects instead. Next is the 304, HTTP status code 304 not modified. So the not modified is returned when a file is unchanged on the server since it was last accessed, right? So browsers and bots, they make requests and they have an if modified since header. If the file has not been modified since then, the request won't be fulfilled. This is kind of a crawl path optimization uh, response that you wanna go for. Most small websites don't need this. But if you're a massive site, this is actually a huge optimization. We had this at Airbnb uh, when we were getting you know, tens of millions of Googlebot requests a day, but half of our pages were unchanged. By returning a 304 not modified header, you can sort of save some of your crawl budget and allocate uh, Google's bots to go find new pages that it doesn't know about yet, right? So this is kind of gets incrementally more valuable 
as you have more crawl budget, as you have more pages, as you get more authoritative, right? The more comprehensive a website you have and the more stuff you need Google to find, the more this becomes valuable. If you're under a thousand pages or even under 10,000 pages, this is a little bit less valuable. But as you kind of move up to the um, hundreds of thousands and millions of pages, this becomes incrementally more valuable. Okay, next up is the 401 unauthorized. So we're talking about client errors now. So a 401 unauthorized means your login credentials aren't working, right? They're not valid. The server doesn't know who you are and they're simply asking you to log in again. So this is usually a, um, like if you have a membership site or um, you have some type of login credentials on a web application, uh, returning a 401 when something went wrong with the credentials is usually the right move. Now a 403 is similar, but has but as it has a unique difference, right? So a 403 status code is forbidden. The difference here, right, a 403 error is much more explicit than a 401. A 403 is saying, okay, we know who you are, you tried to log in, but we're explicitly telling you that you're not allowed to access whatever you're trying to access, right? An example might be if I go to the bar and I have an out-of-state ID, the bouncer says, hey, do you have a different ID actually? We can't accept that here. That's a 401, right? Like, oh, sorry, can you try again? A 403 would be if I walked into that same bar and they said, no, 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 we know you. You can't come in here, <laughs> right? That'd be a 403, right? Explicitly telling me I can't go in. Happens all the time. It's a rough, it's a rough life I lead. 404, HTTP status code 404, not found. Very common one, everyone knows this one. The URL being requested simply wasn't found. It's not true that 404s are all bad. This is actually a misconception. It's fine to serve a 404 if you simply don't have that page, right? If a user misspells a URL, you don't have to redirect every conceivable URL. It's totally fine to serve a 404. You can actually solve this by having a really great 404 page. Sorry, the page you requested wasn't found. Here are some of our most popular links, right? Click, 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 click. All authoritative pages that are 404s, you absolutely should replace, right? And so you have a page, you have a URL, it used to have a ton of links, or it has a ton of links, and now it's serving a 404. You wanna be 301 redirecting that to the most relevant um, page you have on your site. You don't wanna leave that as is. But general, you know, uh, the, the URL never existed, it was mistyped. It's totally fine to serve a 404 when there really isn't a page there. Right? This is a totally normal behavior. You're not gonna get hurt by Google at all for this. Okay, so next up is the HTTP status code 410 gone. So similar to a 404, but a little bit more explicit. The gone uh, response code means that the page is truly gone. It's no longer available on the server and no redirect was set up. Sometimes webmasters, webmasters wanna be very explicit to Google and other search engines that a page is gone. Uh, this is a much more direct signal to Google that a page is truly gone and never coming back. Whereas if Google finds a 404, it may actually kind of keep returning, keep crawling for a little while longer and actually checking and making sure that, hey, is it? did you really mean that? A 410 is very explicitly saying, no, 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 this page is gone. I don't know a ton of reasons why you would do this. Um, it, it's really in the nerd folklore uh, area. I, I don't really see too much reason to do that. Stick with a 404, you should be fine. Status code 429, too many requests. I had a lot of problems with this in the past. The basic idea here, again, a client side error is it's the 400 block. The user sending too many requests in a given amount of time. This is also colloquially known as rate limiting. Right, so be very careful of rate limiting search engines. Um, if you have an engineering team that's very aggressively trying to block bots and do other things, rate limiting search engines is a bad idea. It's very often that you will get rate limited, right? Um, a lot of uh, search engine ranking tools get rate limited by Google, right? They, they make too many requests. DDoS, right, distributed denial of service attacks are essentially rate limiting problems. And by blocking a certain IP address or only allowing a certain IP address to make so many requests over a certain period of time, that's kind of the first line of defense in uh, blocking DDoS attacks. So 429 means, hey, you're, you're basically requesting too much. Um, and it's usually the client uh, sending over too much stuff. 500, internal server server error. This one is a classic. This is just a problem with your server. It's kind of a ambiguous error. Um, the server doesn't exactly know what's wrong, but it knows something is wrong. This isn't good. Uh, you wanna fix this as soon as possible. You usually have to contact your web host in order to get this one sorted out. Uh, but it's just kind of a general problem with the server 
response and uh, you see this a lot. You see this a lot and you usually wanna contact your host as soon as possible. A 503, service unavailable. So again, on the server side, because it's in the 500 block, so this is similar to a 500 error, but it, it means the server is unavailable, but it usually means it's an expected error, right? So a 500 error is usually an unexpected error, like, hey, something went wrong with the server, but we don't know what happened. With a 503 error, it's usually an expected error that the server intentionally sends, right? It usually means you didn't pay your bill or you had more requests than your plan allows, something like that, but it's like, hey, something's wrong, but we knew it was wrong. And you, it's usually the same process, you just have to contact your web host to get it sorted. The 504, the gateway timeout. So again, 500 block server error. A 504 means the server did not receive a response fast enough from another server that it was making a request to, right? Again, same issue, you usually need to contact your web host to get this one sorted. But what it usually means is that something else broke that was kind of reliant or that you were relying on and uh, it broke, it, you timed out and you weren't able to, uh, the server wasn't able to complete the full request. There's your guide to HTTP status codes. Hope that's helpful for you, your website and your digital marketing plan. So if that was useful, I hope it was helpful. If it was useful and if you learned something today, go ahead and click subscribe down below to get even more digital marketing tactics and tips from us. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and leave a comment as well. I would love to hear from you. What'd you think of this? Did I miss any status codes? How do you usually check your HTTP status codes? Are you having any problems? Leave a reply. I read every single one. Finally, if you want this exact checklist along with tools that we use to check our HTTP status codes and a comprehensive checklist to fix all these problems, we have a free downloadable for you. Just go ahead in the resources down below and click that link to clickminded.com to get this as a downloadable freebie.